once in the last 72 hours? <laughs> who's, who's still really? a little drunk? Really? <laughs> um, no. Who's just naturally that way? <laughs> yes. Welcome. You have arrived at the uh, Women in Ultimate History panel, right? Is that the right one? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we <laughs> scroll away our little cards. Oh, yeah. Funny, funny <laughs> story. Chipmunks. I started the professional steampunk panel in this room an hour and a half ago, and I kept waiting for. I knew Katie was on a panel, and I kept waiting for the girl in the pink hair to come in. <laughs> and she's in the next room Imagine over that. on the panel she's supposed to be on. <laughs> so um, it's gotten to that stage in the game. It's, it's Monday at Con. It's Monday Maybe you say Monday. more. We have a fabulous collection of women at the table here to uh, talk with you. Jana Oliver on the end. Uh, one of my favorite books going on right now is the Demon Trapper's Daughter, the Demon Trapper's series, which I adore. Yes, read um, it. Mm, I actually so wept right. openly in chapter eight on the uh, elliptical machine of Jim. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I sent a message to Jen and said, I'm reading your book and I'm weeping. And she says, they just think you have it set on Everest. <laughs> She's a very funny lady. Next, Katie Cross, uh, author of, one of another of my favorite books, which is um, The Girl in the Steel Corset. Read that to the girls I eat M Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, we, there's candy in a box going around. If you haven't gotten your share of uh, peanuts and sweets and whatnot, we can get some of those. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a hoard and I will share. Sitting next to I Katie won't. Cross with a hoard of chocolate <laughs> is Catherine Hines. Catherine's written more than 40 middle grade years in uh, books, nonfiction, and history, and she is also my editor. Um, she edits for one of the major publishers out of New York, and uh, she's a fantastic writer and a fanta even a more fantastic editor. And I am proud to know her. And we are both. Uh, she's <laughs> editing for me too right now. And, uh, <laughs> I think what she's going to be doing. <laughs> Catherine and I met through the Women's Science Fiction Writers Association called Broad Universe. Whose oh. president? Whose is president right here is here? Row. Yes. <laughs> Best decision I ever made as a genre writer was joining Broad Universe. Good I have care. gotten really? more out of Broad Universe than I, I, I have not actually paid enough yet to be in Broad Universe. So uh, I am Emily P. Bush, I'm a steampunk novelist, and I, I have a uh, best-selling steampunk children's picture book, Her Majesty's Explorer, available here today. And I am, I guess, the moderator of this <laughs> panel as well. So you're standing. I noticed you have no chocolate in front of you. I have consumed it all. <laughs> <laughs> I have consumed more chocolate this morning. And by the way, there are some chocolate covered espresso beans. In the where? Oh, where? Oh, where? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, you know, maybe they've been picked through, but I had a little stash over there. I'll, I'll share. That's because I don't trust a writer that doesn't have candy. <laughs> Uh, we are a happy bunch. We are ready to answer any and all of your questions. Do put your call in the air, and we will call on you to make sure that uh, every question gets answered. We are a little bit punchy up here. We have had one too many hits with the con. <laughs> so if, if it doesn't make sense at all, just ask again. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit about, just to get us started, about the types of women that we write. Um, I referred to my first two novels as feminist steampunk. And I loved a phrase, um, which uh, there's a good bit of theology in mind, where we talk about God and man. And it's a nice, chunky way of writing it. And every time I would send this off to my editor, my editor would write, God and people. <laughs> and God she and had humanity. God and humanity. And we had long kind. We had long discussions about, uh, if you're going to call something feminist, you need to use the nomenclature of the spirit of feminism and uh, so that's one of the things that we can also get into but I do have two very strong female characters in, in, in my first novel and it flows into the second that are generation apart so we look at a lot of the interplay between two generations of women and, and so on so that's the kind of women there are no women actually in Her Majesty's Explorer we have a duck so. <laughs> and, and a very liberated duck. And an atomic duck. Very liberated duck, yes. Actually, how do you know that the duck could be female? Is it ever specified? We call him he. Oh, oh well. <laughs> there we go. Oh, well. <laughs> there could be some confusion. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's a gender well, confused. You know what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really ought to call the duck it. It's it's an it. It has it's it's, a, it's, it's an atomicon. It has no reproductive organs whatsoever. So. <laughs> <laughs> what I dated a guy like that once. <laughs> <laughs> 
I knew I was going to enjoy this panel. <laughs> okay, Catherine. This is where I don't drink. <laughs> What, what's the question? Oh, <laughs> what, what kind of women do I? Um, okay, well, I have um, a completed novel that is an epic fantasy, so I guess we're not really talking about that here. So uh, I, I like very strong, resourceful women, though. In I've got a couple works in progress. One is a steampunk novel for young adults, and my protagonist is a uh, 15, 16 year old girl who is going off to, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, she is going off to a special school that trains, I'll let, I'll let Emily finish throwing her coffee. It's very distracting to talk when you're doing this. Sorry, that's okay. Uh, so she is going off to a special school that trains girls in technology and trains them to be inventors and to, uh, to work with the new, exciting new technologies of the late 19th century. And her cousin is an aspiring journalist who wants to be the next Nellie Bly. Uh, my other work in progress in alternate history is set in an alternate 1750s in uh, Pennsylvania, upstate New York, um, and Lake Ontario. And the protagonist of that book is a, is a preacher. And in this world, it is perfectly normal in this time period for, for women to be preachers. And she's a circuit rider. And she gets uh, kidnapped by uh, this crew of, of people on a, on a ship out on the lake. And the ship has a co-ed crew as well. And again, it's the, the gender roles are, are quite, quite different because history took some different turns. I also have a steampunk story coming out in the anthology Dreams of Steam 3, which is coming out from Curlac Curlac Press, Curlac. Press in a couple months, I think. And the protagonist of that story is a fortune-telling machine. <laughs> it's a very oh, good story. Such, they're creepy, Thank but I like them. Now, Katie, you have a very strong one. Mm, I have a couple. Um, as Katie Cross, I write them the Girl in the Steel Corset and the Steampunk Chronicles for Harlequin Teen. And so my main female lead in that series is Finley Jane, who literally starts out as a Jekyll and Hyde character. She has two very distinct parts of her personality, so she's trying to put them together. But the book opens with uh, the son of the, the man of the house where she works. Um, he has a bit of a, an annoying habit of pestering. Uh, the maids in the household, and he comes after Finley, and she she leaves him at the end of the scene, lying on the floor with the imprint of her boot on his forehead. Woo! So, well, deserved. she's kind of strong, um, <laughs> and, and physically, and emotionally, and mentally as well. Finley is a pretty a, a pretty tough chick. Um, then there's also Emily. Emily is nowhere near as physically strong as Finley, but she's the the science girl. She's the, um, she can, even if a machine is broke, she can put it back together. If a person's broke, she can put it back together. Um, sometimes she makes a combination of the two. Um, and so she's strong in different ways. Uh, I would say that... With different levels of appreciation coming from those who she fixes. <laughs> there is that. Um, so while she's not as physically strong as Finley, I, I'd like to say that maybe Emily is a bit more um, emotionally strong than, uh, than Finley will probably ever be. As Kate Cross, I write steampunk romance. So this is where it's interesting because a lot of people, uh, you know, in a lot of feminist circles, romance is not considered an especially feminist um, form of literature. But, oh thank you, that's a still course Um But what's interesting is that it, the romance industry is women writing books for women. And not just that, usually they're agented by women and they're edited by women. So it's a very woman strong kind of thing. And you know, we don't it's not like it was back in the seventies with that term with the with the bodice strippers and whatnot. I mean these days romances are being written by with very capable female characters. And the heroine of um, Heart of Brass, my first steampunk romance, um, is Arden. And Arden is an inventor for sort of like an MI6 kind of um, organization in Britain, 
and she's very strong and um, very smart, and I would challenge anybody to, to go up against her. So I'm, what I'm loving about this series is my editor's being very great in letting me write these wonderful women that I would actually like to be friends with. Hell, I would actually like to be, be them. Um, when it used to be, it was my male characters that I really related to. Now I'm, now I'm able to write these wonderful women. And then as Kate Locke, no, it's too many personalities, but um, as Kate Locke, I write the Immortal Empire series for Orbit Books. The first book, um, God Save the Queen, came out earlier this summer, and that has a half vampire heroine. It's set in an alternate Victor uh, London where Queen Victoria is a vampire and still on the throne. And um, she, she is my favorite ever. Vampire ever. No, not Victoria. No. Xander the Heron. She is my favorite ever. I love her. I love her. I love her. I think it's a little scary how much I love her because she's become so real in my head. And she is not one of those uh, urban fan typical urban fantasy uh, women who can do everything. Xandra does know her limits to an extent. And Xandra is not always nice. And she's not always pretty. And um, she's a bit of a bigot in some ways towards humans. She think, looks down on humans, and um, her views of the world are very messed up. Xandra is a monster, and, and, and both literally and figuratively in a lot of ways. And um, I just absolutely love her, and I think she's probably one of the, one of the strongest characters I've ever, ever written. I, in fact, I think Finley would be afraid of Xandra. Ooh. Well, I write two different, I've written two different series. Uh, the first series uh, is the Time Rover series, which is essentially Time Travelers, Shapeshifters, and Jack the Ripper. And uh, that's, oh that's, that's, yeah, oh mine. Uh, of course, set in 1888, no surprise there. When my heroine in there is Jacinda Lassiter, who is a, an adult, it's an adult series, um, who is an adult uh, Time Rover, who comes back and hunts up these academics who go off doing research in the back alleys of Whitechapel, usually in the, uh, the dot, oh, usually in the whorehouses or the uh, the pubs, though they always claim they go to the British Library. And um, oh, the fun places. yeah, you know. And so she hunts them up when they get missing and, and brings them back because they like to go AWOL because man, hey, they can run around and do all sorts of fun stuff that they can't do at home when mom, you know, the wife's back in 2057. And Jacinda is one of the is a very cynical character. She has been doing time roving. You know, it's a senior time rover, and the company she's working for is going bankrupt. And so they're pushing her further and further and further into more dangerous situations. Her brain is being Swiss cheese by something called time lag because they're not allowing her to rest between her journeys. And so she is pretty much a real cynical but kick butt character. She's not, she's, she gets mad at you and she'll just punch you. Uh, she's one of those. And, but she's a very smart little lady. And it's, it's fun to watch her over the journey of the three books in the series come to grips with the Victorian era, which she hates, and meeting up with new people and learning some new things and essentially being broken down to her, her, her basic elements because the time lag actually does make her nearly insane and watching her rebuild herself. So she's one of my fave characters because she was so strong to start with and she gets savvy and strong by the end of the series and that, that I really like that change. The other series is a young adult, so Riley Blackthorne is not just in the head make sure they were not the same. And Riley's seven, uh, 17, and uh, she really wants, she's a really independent little girl, but she makes mistakes. She makes, well, she's 17. And so you go, well, I can do that. You know, I can go out and trap my own, what, four foot tall hairy demon that can kill a human and eat them in 15 minutes. She goes, yeah, I can try that. Uh, she's one of those brave and gutsy little souls. She goes out and does stuff and it gets her into trouble, yeah, but she learns. She's not too stupid to live. She'll step back there and go, been there, done that, have the claw marks to prove it. I'm not doing that again. And it, in Riley's journey is going from being a very sassy, independent person. She remains that way at the end of the series, but she's older, wiser, and she's learned that there, she can trust people to help her learn and do things. And so it's watching somebody actually mature over three, over the four books, sorry, there's four books in that series. Um, I'm going, How, did I write this or not? <laughs> and there are actually four books. Uh, watching her grow. And so they're two different kinds of characters. And, and Riley isn't as inclined to haul off and kick you as uh, Cinda was, but it's because I was very careful not to make them the same. But they have that same gutsy, independent, I'm going to, you know, God help you if you get in my way attitude. And so at, that's... I, as I get older, I'm like that, but not that gutsy. I don't go after demons. 
but I, I, I get more mouthy. <laughs> and so I think they've been affecting me. Not oh, now, me. come on. Riley's fairly mouthy. Yeah, Riley's <laughs> mouthy. And, you know, I wonder, you know, people, friend, your friends will say, well, that's actually you, Jana. But I'm going, no, no, no. But she gets, I mean, she feels like a, a girl does. I mean, she yeah. gets cut deeply by uh, by, by the, the two, two, three men in her life. Yes, know? she learns some very big lessons of, because it's not really a romance, but there's a romantic thread. And she learns some big lessons about love and, and trust and betrayal and all those things are very, really sharp edged when you're 17. Something we can probably all relate to when yes. we're 17 year old selves. Um, so uh, in the audience, uh, any questions for our panel thus far? Based Anybody? On them. No. More espresso beans. <laughs> More espresso beans. <laughs> yes, question. Um, this is for Katie? Katie, pink hair. She had um, the, the lovely pink hair. Hey, you. Hey, with the pink hair, you, that one. Um, how do you, how do, how do you balance, <laughs> sorry, no, no attention span. How do you balance the, uh, with, with your half vampire Xandra, you said her name? Mm -hmm. With the half vampire, her human side as opposed to her monster side, because I would feel having the half, unless she's not half human, she's half vampire, half something else, I would feel having that. Oh, they're not giving away the plot. Let's <laughs> um, just say she finds some things out. Um, she would, she would hate to consider herself half human, and she pays as little attention to that as she can. And the way she almost excuses herself for being half human is that her mother is what's called a breeding courtesan, and and there were these courtesans that were elevated because they were actually women with the right genetic material to carry vampire or werewolf babies full term. And not die. <laughs> and not die, because as part of it, the, the werewolves and the vampires are having a very hard time reproducing on their own, just because of you know all that inbreeding and whatnot that happened in Britain once upon a time. Um, mm -hmm. So they're having a very hard time doing that, so they can produce these half-bloods with these um, genetically matched humans. So she considers her mother not quite human, or at least a very special human, so she's definitely better than you know, the average. And that's sort of how she gets around balancing that, but she wouldn't even consider herself human to any degree. And she'd probably argue it if somebody, somebody brought it up, but she's, she's really a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she's kind of like Magneto that way. Yeah. She has her moments, definitely. <laughs> I like her. Yes. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. In the purple there. Uh, in dealing with steampunk women, it seems, it sounds like uh, the women are generally going to be stronger than, say, you know, fate, Victorian woman and romance and that kind of thing. How do you balance their relationships with male characters? Because males tend to take dominance, especially when you're talking about... I think that's a matter of balance and equality, um, and coming from that, that romance writing background too. That's just it. Um, ha have you all watched Buffy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. So, which did you like better? Riley when he was all jacked up and juiced up and a super soldier, or Riley after they took him off all the junk and he was just a guy? After Riley became just a guy, he was no longer a match for Buffy. He was no longer her equal or even anywhere close to it. And that's why they could never make Angel human. And that's why eventually they figured out, oh, this is not gonna work. Um, because of course she would never become a vampire. But the secret to that is making your characters equal, but with balance. So they just have different strengths in different areas. But you, you know, you can't write an overly, I'm sorry, you can't write an overly strong or intimidating, forceful kind of guy and then put him together with this meek little dormouse. It's just not, it's not going to work, so you need to find that. It's like, it's like Batman, I'm just saying. It's like Batman and Wonder Woman. Uh, I'll just make that analogy, because she is, a, there's nobody stronger than Wonder Woman. And, unless maybe Superman, and but the two of them together would be disgustingly. Oh, they've got that in the new book. I know, and I'm just sort of like, what are you effing killing me? Like, like <laughs> why? Like the two of them together in this world. Why? It's like putting a Girl Scout with a Boy Scout, and then saying, "Go sell some cookies." 
<laughs> Batman and Wonder Woman were fabulous. Batman will never be as physically strong as her, but his strengths lie in a lot of different areas. And so I think that's why, you know, that makes that good pairing. And that's why Jean Grey was better off with Wolverine and not Cyclops. That's what I the was Cyclops thinking. Cyclops was not yes. Jean Grey's equal in any way, shape, or form. Now, to, to continue the Buffy uh, analogy, though, Buffy is not a man with breasts either. Mm -hmm. I mean, Buffy was. No. I mean, other than the fact that she was physically strong and witty, she was a girl, but girl. she was a hot mess the rest of the time. I mean, she really had a lot of problems, which is, I think, you know, one of the things that Whedon does well is makes these sort of anti-heroes. Um, <laughs> You which have to. You have to. You, they're perfect. They're boring. Right. You want them to have, you know, where they claim to be one thing and they're out but, doing something, but they're tortured well, about what they're a doing. Lot, I see a lot of these, these these airship pirates characters in steampunk, and I go, it's a man with breasts. I mean, because, again, I've often said, <laughs> there's, there's kind of three styles of women in steampunk, which is the, you know, dowdy librarian, clockwork hooker, and she's wearing his clothes. You know, <laughs> for the most part, they come that way. Um, and I'm thinking, Jay Lee, <laughs> we're going to have a, Catherine and I are going to have a fist fight about the two books that we do not see eye to eye on. We're opposites on Jay Lake's Mainspring and Stephen Hunt's Court of the Air. No, Bone Shaker. Sherry oh, Bone, Bone Shaker. Shaker as well. Yes, we both disagree on that one, too. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, okay, so there's, 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 there's any strong woman. In Jay Lake's books, ends up getting blown away or marginalized. You know, there's Mother Lode, the gun dealer. You know, and that's just you know, one of those things. And, and, <laughs> and then there's also the girl who's dressed as the. I mean, all of them are in in Court of the Air. Um, no, I mean, Mainspring. And okay, it's like I, I could not. It's like I keep reading that book. I mean, oh yay, a female character. Well, oh. oh. She's gone after one chapter, and it's like, oh, another, f oh. <laughs> yeah, and they don't last long. It's no. kind of like all the Sean Bean's movies, isn't yeah. it? Like, yeah, kind of like, yeah. Like, yeah. Sean yeah. Bean's got killed again. <laughs> <laughs> you know who else? Liam Neeson is always getting it. Yeah, his movies. Yeah, like, you know. uh, but we digress. We do. Uh, but the, the Buffy, Buffy actually really addresses us in a lot of ways too, because it's like when they finally decided they were going to put Buffy and Spike together. Buffy and Spike worked when they were more conflicted. Mm -hmm. yes. I, yes. I refer to it too as the that period as the great emasculation of Spike. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they try to toughen him up by making him a would-be rapist. They just made him pathetic, and I would have liked to have gone and just slapped those writers. Um, silly. They really changed his character to try and get him involved with Buffy, or maybe like nice him up a little bit, and then they just they just made a, a parody of him. When really they should have just kept him as Spike because that's how we all loved him, and that's where the most conflict was, and where the most balance was between them is because she was this righteous little thing that was going off and would do whatever, um, yeah, and <laughs> run over anybody she had to to achieve her goal. And Spike was just really kind of like, oh, let's just wind him up and see where they go. Kind of thing, right? Although it was the dirtiest exactly. five minutes of television when Spike and Buffy actually got together for the first time in the fall. When that, that was the house there? Yes. Yeah. Y'all, we, we, we digress again. There was a question over here, I think. Oh, too. please, somebody save us with a question. Yeah. Stop <laughs> us before we kill again. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, because it, it seems that as a trend, women are becoming much stronger in, in books across all genres. But then we get some of these, like, Twilight and the Fifty Shades series. Why do you think that these are so popular, and why are these weak women, you know, in a period where we're, we're getting away from that, why do we keep going back to these I think that's a really kind of, um, I don't want to say weird, because I don't want to belittle anybody's reading tastes, okay? But it buys into this kind of fantasy aspect, and I think that's really how you have to approach these kind of books when you're when you're not somebody who gets it. Um, because I will admit to you, I don't get Twilight. Um, and I once read um, a list of, if, if, if your relationship fall, has any of these things, um, it's an abusive relationship. There was a list, I think, of 17, and Twilight fit to hit 15 of them, yeah. um, which is really disturbing when you start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody, any girl or woman, actually wants some wacko watching her sleep. There's, um, it just sounds there's this, it's this, it's this <laughs> level of fantasy, and um, who was that woman that used to put out the erotica fantasy? Like, um, what was her name? That woman, Nancy, somebody that used to put together the books that were like. 
she was Nancy like, Friday. Yes, thank you. And she would do these, and she would talk to women about their fantasies. And some of them were just sort of outrageous, and, and maybe some maybe with some violence or being dominated oh, and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and but it, and it really wasn't like this was not anything that anybody would really want to have in real life. But getting caught up in that fantasy where you can go ahead and like it because you don't have a choice and. That, See, that probably sounds really weird to you, right? And it, I would take well, the opposite. And, uh, yeah. Well, I would, I would take the opposite on that. There was a very interesting article about um, um, the Fifty Shades, and, and to a lesser extent, I suppose it extrapolates to Bella since it is fanfic. But um, <laughs> yes. the Fifty Shades is fanfic. Um, Newsweek had an article about why women like this, and, and I can understand it. I mean, when you're in charge all day long, every day, and you go home, and you want, in between the sheets, you want somebody else to drive. I, I mean, that was the argument that they were making in, in this article from Newsweek, and I thought for a minute, and I went, okay, I'll buy that. <laughs> but I, there's, there's, there's some element of women in high pressure, high um, dollar, high responsibility jobs, and that could be anything from CEO to mom, um, where they yeah, want High dollar is not necessarily. Not exactly. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it could be, you know, but it is high stress and it is high responsibility right. and nobody is gonna look at, I am the last line of defense, no one is going to look after these children after me because there is no one else. You know, I mean, there's that kind of pressure and then they just want, um, to let go. And it's pure escape. Okay. Yeah, it's well, pure escapism, and that's really yeah. that's because I, you know, I read a little bit of it and it went oh, okay. By now, I would have done what I would have done with Edward, which was stake the bugger. But <laughs> and that's my just default response to everything, which is why my husband doesn't allow me wooden stakes. <laughs> oh, you can't cash this check for me. Die. So um, he didn't yeah. even look up when you no, said he, that. He no. just kept his head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, here's, here, here's my theory about Bella and her kindred. Uh, first, one of my very dear friends loves the whole Twilight series, and she's a strong, smart feminist woman. And Is it I me? don't. No. <laughs> Another one of my strong, smart, feminist women friends. And, and she said the reason she loves it is because she thinks that for women, protection equals love, and that Twilight plays into that. I disagree with her on both those points, but that was how <laughs> she approached it. My own personal theory is that I think it goes back to the, the Cinderella story. Um, this is the only way I can understand it, is that I feel like I'm a nothing, I'm nothing special, I'm nobody, and then somebody comes along and to them I'm special. They see they see that I really am the princess or I really am, you know, the, he, the he girl that the stands out from all the others. Me. You know, so I mean and that's that's the only thing that I get out of it that I can understand anyway, is that, you know, we all feel misunderstood and a lot of the time or that we're not anything special and then somebody comes along and says yes you are you are the special one I mean, um, you'd be even more special if you sat on this chocolate cake for me <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I personally I prefer <laughs> Stick with pie. <laughs> well, you know, I'm actually looking at that that sort of myth that uh, I'm currently working on a, a, a retelling of uh, Sleeping Beauty, where you know, and the the heroine is so not Riley, but she's 16. Uh, I had to make her completely different, and I'm going. Wouldn't it be interesting to start with a young girl who believed that that was everything? She was waiting for somebody to ride in and mm -hmm. carry her off in the white horse. By the end of the story, she's going. That sucks. You know what? She will have looked at the broader picture of life and gone, okay, yes, I can find myself a prince, but he isn't necessarily going to be the guy. Why, you know, why is it required to marry somebody if he just wakes you up with a kiss? I mean, or other things. It depends on where you go with the, you know, the, the Sleeping Beauty. My uh, yeah, yeah, the mythos, yeah. But that, that's very interesting because it, it, some folks are more comfortable with that big picture and then others start to look at it at the deeper levels and what does it really mean and what do I want as a prince and why is it that I don't have any say in this and it, it mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm having grand time tearing yeah, that yeah, apart yeah. and messing with it mm -hmm. and totally warping it <laughs> I guess I can't do it once I warp it but I mean I I personally prefer 
uh, female protagonists who are, you know, recognized as special for their intelligence or their resilience, their strength of character, their willingness to sacrifice themselves for their people, and the these kinds of things. And I'll just I see Trisha's hand up, but I just want to, I have to, I can't let the, the men with breasts thing pass. <laughs> Emily's probably sitting there going, I got away with it this time. I never do. <laughs> I never do. <laughs> and, and I think that's interesting to me because, again, as you can tell, Emily and I talk about books and characters a lot. A lot. <laughs> and she'll say, that's just a, a man with breasts. And I'll say, no, I don't get that that way. So um, it just goes to show, you just can't say, women love this in a book. Women really like to read this. We're all different. And it really, I get so irritated when I read commentators talking about, this is why women love this book, or this is, you know, how women's psyche works. And, and that's why you, know, you still live in your so mother's better. basement. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I find, you know, personally, a character that turns me on, I'm much more sapiosexual, you know, I like, I like a brains and talent. The two things that I find attractive in another person, brains and talent, you know, and so, but that doesn't mean we're, that I we're didn't both see... married to musicians. Um, I married the drummer. Um, so, I'm so sorry. So, I, this one here takes me uh, uh, to, to a little thing over in another hotel where in walks the, the three actors from from True Blood, and I, for as much as I like brains and talent, when Joe, what's his name, oh, tall, big, oh, yeah. handsome, oh, yes. I, I just went, hot, diggity damn. That'll do. But the point is, you know, we say yes, so many yeah. things about like, well, this is what we want out of it. But then, and every once in a while, something happens, if inexplicably, that you go, yeah. That's the hardwiring. I'll, I'll follow that yeah. for a half That's hour. That's the business. <laughs> yeah. one, one does has a, have a certain aesthetic sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. I bet you he's very good at math. <laughs> <laughs> and he's probably an excellent yeah. conversationalist. I'm sure he can figure out what he's getting paid by the minute to stand there and be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's take Trisha's question. Let's do oh, that. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. We got racy. That's okay. I'm still um, I was going to kind of lead in a little bit on that is, um, with steampunk and in the um, in the steampunk genre, um, are you seeing more opportunity for women women's characters to explore less traditional? I mean, this great kick-ass roles, and I love kick-ass roles. But is there more opportunity to be the heroine um, and do more of a heroine's journey as opposed to a hero's journey? And is there more? What are some of the options that steampunk offers for women to do a, tra a non-traditional? heroic protagonist role? Well, let me tell you, um, I used to think that I had no interest in the Victorian period at all. And then my husband started getting involved in the maker community. And so I said, oh, this steampunk. Okay, let me check it out. And I got to thinking, oh, that's right. This is the period when Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were working for women's suffrage and all of these, you know, advances and consciousness raising about women's rights were going on, and that is something that I am all about. And I said, this is this is what I embrace in this period. So, for example, my my steampunk persona never wears a corset. Um, I'm a I'm a bloomers wearer, you know, and dress and reform. Dress reform. I love the the whole dress reform thing. Still put corsets under those. Sometimes, sometimes not. There were there were a lot of um, there were certain utopian movements yeah, in right. New York State where they and um, well, there's some of those women who wouldn't have managed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, structurally, after so many years of yes. course, they yes. wouldn't yeah. have managed yeah. otherwise. But I mean, Louisa May Alcott was a big um, campaigner against corsetry, and the and there were there were. Uh, Women were becoming adventurers. You know, so this is stuff that women were inventing things. Women were adventuring. I'm reading a great book right now called Dreaming of East, which is all about uh, women travelers going to the Middle East and often embracing the Middle Eastern style of dress because it was 
uncorseted and discovering the liberation of wearing pantaloons and riding astride rather than side saddle. So in this period, there is so much room to explore the heroine's journey, to have women adventurers. And, you know, Emily talks about, um, I'm wearing his clothes. And that is a trope in a lot of steampunk, like in Scott Westerfeld's Leviathan series. You know, you have the, the female protagonist who's dressed up as a boy. And of course, you know, this goes back to Shakespeare and, and beyond, this, this convention. But the fact of the matter is that before the modern military with the, with the required physicals and everything, every single war our nation ever fought in, women were in battle, wearing men's clothes, just you know, going under men's names. Um, it's, it's fact, it's history, it's not just a literary convention. So again, you have, you have that kind of thing as well. And some of these women, um, they were never, it was never discovered that they were in fact women until uh, there was Frank Thompson was the name she fought under in the, the Civil War. They finally discovered she was a woman because she was injured. But some women, you know, did their whole service and, you know, never, and blah, blah, blah. Running there's, out of steam. There's Monday. A great, um, Somebody there's, else talk. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great woman character in a, a book that I've just finished reading called um, My Gun is My Passport. Uh, the story of the first U.S. cowboy in Afghanistan, mm. set in about uh, 1910. And the character is called the Star of Africa, and she leads a uh, basically a warlord troop in Afghanistan. And it's very interesting how um, the author is uh, Hoke Hokum. Um, I think it's W. Hoke Hokum is his name. I could look it up, I suppose. I have it right here. Um, writes this character who, um, she comes from Africa because she had been bought and sold several times by first her family and then by you know the, the people who then acquired her. Um, she'd had husbands, she'd had owners, she'd had a lot of things and she finally ends up um, relationship with the protagonist, um, it's very interesting how she goes about it. Um, so it's a very complicated woman, and I enjoyed it very much. So What's that title again? My Gun is My Passport? My, my Gun is My Passport. Take uh, note. Yeah. Um, that was a good one. I, I, um, I was pleasantly surprised when I saw The guy who wrote this story is a guy who deals in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's what he does for a Ooh, living. Is he, he teaches he teaches law enforcement. And there are several scenes in this book where I'm reading along and I go, <laughs> <laughs> the way the, some of these fight scenes are absolutely gross. <laughs> so. Okay, hope I didn't lose my question there. Um, you mentioned a lot of great examples of real life women in these time periods that, I mean, I guess maybe they did go against the norm, but they were very strong female mm -hmm. people. Um, and yet I find a lot of uh, steampunk, female steampunk characters, strong female steampunk characters, are really working in situations much more based on our current social mores. Mm -hmm. Is that because it's just easier to go into that, or because is that where the audience wants it to come from? I'm, I'm almost more interested in seeing characters more based in the actual Victorian yeah. um, cultural mores, yet actually like like these people like Susan B. Anthony <coughs> who are strong female characters within that, those right. restrictions, yeah. as opposed to somebody who acts like we do today with all what we have had through the history of women's liberation. I, I don't know if I, I kind of want to... No, I see what that. you mean, and I think I don't want to monopolize, so I'll just give my short answer and then let somebody else talk. Um, I, I think part of the reason that steampunk is capturing so many people's imaginations is that I think um, in that period, in the 19th century, early 20th century, is very analogous to where we are in our own culture right now. I mean, we're having um, discussions that women of my generation thought we had settled these issues, but all of a sudden, is birth control okay? I, I mean, we're, we're really... You have, burned something back in the 70s, yeah. didn't you? <laughs> I'm that old. No, I'm not. Okay, you know. <laughs> 
But uh, as a as a very young teenager. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I think late. I think we're 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 facing so many of the same issues issues of of race and class and gender equality and advancing rapidly advancing technology. So I think a lot of writers are using steampunk at, really as a mirror for our culture. Um, because I've, I've, I've written so much history and I, I really have a huge interest in social history and obviously women's history, you know, my work is tending to be more like what you're describing about you know, the women of that time. So I have like this girls' school, I went to a women's college that was founded in the 1800s and you know, those are the kinds of things I'm interested in and bringing forward. But I think it's also valid to, to also you know, hold this era up as a mirror to, to modern times. Keep in mind too that when you're talking about these, this time period, if, if you're dealing mostly with Victorian, um, that while these women were incredible and they were doing these different things, they, they were not the norm, right? Right. So um, you, you can just imagine what it would be like to be one of these women and then all the things that they would face and, mm -hmm. and the judgment yeah. and whatnot as well. Um, yeah. Wasn't it Nellie Bly who did the 10 Days in a Madhouse? Yes. Um, uh, I haven't read it yet, but I have it, and I, I she it. actually, you know, was a, like went undercover as like a journalist kind of thing, and she went to um, Blackwell. Um, it, it was in the United States. Yeah, it's a Blackwell yeah, yeah, asylum, which was the on name Blackwell's of yes, island, yes, yes, which yes, is that's Roosevelt it. Island mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. near yeah, Manhattan. That's right. And she went in there and posed as a patient for ten days, and and they didn't tell them that she wasn't actually a patient. Mm -hmm. So she went in and, and, and suffered through whatever happened she, to this and woman and had to get somebody to come get her. Yeah. yeah. She Nellie Bly invented investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. And you can um, imagine that wasn't easy. They probably treated her atrociously. I can't wait to read the book. Yeah. And um, and that just that wasn't normal for women to do that kind of thing. So I think you could possibly do what we're talking about mm -hmm. and still do what you're talking about. And the fact that if you're going to make one of these special characters or make one of these women special for something, well, there's, I'm a big fan of consequences. Yeah, there's going to be repercussions. So, exactly. Right. But the point is, when, when, when we hear the story about Nellie Bly, we say, yeah, sister, you go in and uncover it. Mm -hmm. Her contemporaries were likely to say, you draw what, you, what, what foolish thing are you doing? What, where is your good sense work? And that's the difference, of, especially from a writer's perspective and as a reader's perspective. We can mm -hmm. only look at these stories with the experiences that we had in the 21st century. You know, so to say, um, in, a, in, a, in a culture where we live, where it's okay for a woman to be with another woman um, you know, on the street, it's, it, it's frowned upon now to throw fruit at them. You know, if they should. Um, <laughs> that's just a waste of a good banana. It, 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 but, you know, My God, I just realized that that came out. <laughs> I was waiting. I know. Oh, you were to go dig. Oh, yeah. dig. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No yeah. disrespect to any fruit. lesbians anywhere, please. Oh, God. I'm stopping talking. Yeah. Would you like to change that to some other fruit? fruit. Is it an awfully nice hair? No. <laughs> Apple? We no have more fruit jokes. No more fruit jokes. I, I saw it. <laughs> But you see what I'm saying? We look at things because we do. What, what the, the aspect of a character being subversive in a Victorian setting is going to mean one thing to us than it would mean to right. someone of that period. They're totally different things. Um, so it's perspective and it's time and it's, it's and, and again, you can write a wonderfully period Victorian novel, but no Victorian isn't going to read it. It's going to be a 21st century person that's going to read it. So, and, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, we got to work on that. Yeah. You know, Tardis, unicorn farts, whatever. I'm really a great fan of taking somebody like a fish out of water, and that's part of the reason I brought a time traveler back, especially a time traveler who hates Victorian love, to loathes it, and. Uh, to put her into the situation where she has to be there for a length of time and then she does end up meeting up with some very strong Victorian women and realizing where she always kind of went, she always kind of sneered like it was just, you know, the guys were all showing us jerks and the women were all submissive. When she starts, to, when she starts actually living in the society, not just bringing in academics and hauling them out again, where she actually has to stay and start to see, she starts to see the layers of how some of the ladies and some of the guys are fighting 
against the system or the accepted norms and the consequences, as you said, the consequences that happen for them by the fact that they're doing things that others are like not accepting. Like man. Yes. <laughs> uh, another question, just to escape this fruit thing once again. <laughs> yes. Um, you actually answered one of my questions, but I did want to bring up, uh, there's a movie that came out in the 70s, 80s-ish, that discusses, it, it's set in the future, uh, probably 50 years from now, where, and, and it's really weirdly premonitory, uh, where they've taken away women's, basically women's uh, sexual rights, where women are no longer allowed to even buy birth control because it's considered a form of abortion to prevent pregnancy. But, Imagine. but yeah, I know it's. Hey, but this was on, like, but this is like 20 years ago, and suddenly we're getting all this legislation that's actually beginning to go through to take it away, which is really disturbing. Um, but it's a good movie. Oh, Margaret Atwood, yeah. With, yeah. with the woman from Law and Order who was... I don't know, it's, it's, from, it's, it's you know, a the, great book yeah. by Margaret Atwood that they made into a kind of crappy oh, movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great book. Terrible book. <laughs> the one I watched is oh, actually a pretty know. interesting movie. I thought it was an interesting discussion. Yeah. Stage is a documentary. Oh, oh, it's a documentary. Yeah, it's a fictional documentary. It doesn't... It, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. That's interesting. Um, but back to the gender roles, you get to explore a lot of gender roles, and I, you mentioned the soldier from the Civil War. There was also a soldier in World War One who was who was a woman who posed as a man and lived out her, the rest of her life as a man yeah. to the point where she married a woman and even oh. somehow this woman ended up pregnant and having children and she was the father. Oh. Or, so... Well, she had a very good male that. friend. Yeah, that yeah was, exactly. Or, you know, the, the exactly. turkey baster has been around to. for a long time. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> But yeah. do you think, Where there's a world, there's a world. Do you think, and I don't know if you have, but do you think yeah. that because you write an alternate fiction, you get to explore the gender roles and also um, non-traditional genders? Uh, sure. And, okay. Steampunk and, has a lot of that because of the subversion of culture, and I mean, it's just a natural extension. There's a lot of um, uh, cross-dressing and transgender uh, Appeal. Yeah. This this one. Uh, I do likes a lot to walk of around as Mr. Darcy. I do Mr. Darcy yeah. most times. You know, and I I had to say to myself, um, you know, my husband does not question this much, um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's you know, it's like you know, if you dress as a man most evenings when you go to a convention, what does that say about you? Says I'm says I'm done wearing the corset after about six hours. Is what it says <laughs> about me. Um, but yeah, I do. I I dressed as. Um, um, Oscar Wilde yesterday and, and today, and, and also um, yeah, I miss that. So I have a, a, a character in God Save the Queen, my Kate Loft book, who is known as Penny Dreadful, and um, but whose real name is something like Philip, and um, and nobody really thinks anything of it, or, or nobody that loves her as a as a person thinks anything of it, although she does take a, you know get some flack on occasion. Um, and in the book that I just finished, which is the second book, where she and, and Zandra actually talk about it a little bit, because Zandra's never seen her like without her eyebrows on or her wig on and that kind of thing. And and when they talk about it, she's she says, well, you know, why don't you, um, you know, go ahead with the operation then? Like, why don't you take the full change? And and Penny is just like, no, I, I like, you know, sometimes I feel like being, you know, Philip, and sometimes I feel like being. Penny, and because I didn't want to make her into, I didn't want to pigeonhole her into anything, you know, and, and I certainly don't want to go flaunting my, not flaunting my own opinion, but you know, maybe putting any kind of ideas or feelings that I have towards it. Um, I personally am subscribed to that camp that I think drag queens are wondrous, fabulous creatures, and I aspire to be more like them. <laughs> but, but back to, but back to. Um, the, the, the question before, mm -hmm. which was, again, we accept that Oscar Wilde went to jail, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. for being who he was. Yeah. So Mostly because well, he kept bragging about it. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's definitely, there's still a little bit of don't well, ask and don't tell. Yeah. Oh, no way, that's gone the way of the dodo, too. So, But everybody, in every guy in London, in London, England, and the environs beyond knew where to find a rent boy. Yeah, yeah. that wasn't yeah. hard. Well, and Post you know, boys. Two, two things that occur to me, I mean, one, one of my very earliest um, heroines was Georges Sand, the mm -hmm. French writer, and I just, you know, eighth grade, I saw this PBS series called Notorious Woman, which tells you right there in the title how she was regarded in her own time. <laughs> 
But she discovered she could move about Paris freely if she dressed as a man, and she could go to the opera unescorted, and so on. And I just thought that was fantastic. So again, there's another, you know, historic. Um, and she ended up with Hugh Grant. <laughs> there's, a, there's a movie called Impromptu, and, and yeah. Hugh Grant right, right, right. Chopin. Okay. Right, and yeah. Chopin yeah. was fair with George Sand. Yeah, Chopin and George yeah. Sand were a big item. And um, the other thing in this connection is that um, the period, 19th century, was a, a period of a lot of. Um, encounters between different cultures and you know not every culture construes gender the way yeah, we do not. in Britain and Canada and America and Western culture and for example Indonesia I believe there are three or four genders is how people look at it um, in a lot of Native American societies there is a, a kind of middle gender so I think there's a lot of room for in, in Eastern right Eastern. exactly. So there's a lot of room I think in the steampunk universe to to break out of the two gender pattern in in a variety of ways. I'm just going to take a minute right here to say um, thank you all for coming. I have to book out so I can catch a flight. So um, thank you Round for coming to our panel. panel. <laughs> thank you for not going in and food at me. <laughs> and, um, next time. <laughs> I just have to make it to the door. <laughs> I have peanuts we can throw at you. Actually, um, you know what? I could throw an espresso bean at you because right, the coffee remember. bean it is a fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stand back here. Oh, <laughs> Bye, Katie. Bye, Katie. Bye, Katie. We have time for uh, oh more coffee bean. <laughs> coffee I have been here since noon on Thursday, and like in this room. <laughs> um, we have a few more minutes. If there's another question, uh, anyone interested in any other questions? Uh, would you mind going over the uh, three types of steampunk women you mentioned earlier? Dowdy librarian, clockwork hooker. I wrote that one down. <laughs> we all got that. <laughs> She's wearing his clothes. That's just my, you know, your mileage may vary. And, you know, I, there are women out there, like, I love M.K. Hobson's The Native Star. She is not any of those things. She's, she's a, it's definitely a heroine's journey. M.K. Hobson wrote a wonderful character. Uh, there's a line that I really love. There's, she's a witch. In, in a very, 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 like, makes hexes that people put on their barns. You know, it's not a very overtly magic sort of thing. It's just, it's a traditional thing, a traditional medicine. And a wizard comes to town from the big city. And um, this is set out in um, the far west, the, the, the gold rush era of, of California. And um, between that point, you know, heading towards the great exposition of, of 18, what was it? Uh, 1893, you're talking Chicago? No. New York. New York. Um, anyway, not the point. The point is, <laughs> she and this fellow, you know, it's like it's old traditional magic versus the newfangled thing, you know, the Fuller Brush Man, <laughs> basically going door to door selling his magic. And they go like this, and they end up on this adventure together, um, and they, they end up at a hotel at some point where she's got a room, he's got a room, they meet in the lobby, and um, they're all sort of like cleaned up, you know, in their most simple kind of way. and, and um, and uh, she says some flip remark to him like, you look like a, uh, a banker that never says yes to a loan without missing a beat. He says back to her, you look like a woman who never says yes to anything. <laughs> you know? And then they have this repartee that goes back and forth in the dialogue um, through the whole book. And it's, it's a woman character who's definitely a woman standing up against a man character who's totally a, a man. Um, <laughs> and, um, what was that word you almost said? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you see where I skid marks and went off the road. Um, so yeah, it's a good one. M.K. Hobson's The Native Star. But uh, there are many, many women like it. Again, mainspring. Oh, yeah. Okay. Although Court of the Air does have that, their, that the heroine, I mean, uh, that she's sort of Wait, are you talking about Court of the Air or are you talking about Bone Shaker again? No, Court of the Air. Oh, okay. There's a, there's a strong character and there's some weak characters. And Mainspring definitely has weak characters. Weak, weak. weak. weak.
If you wanna, if if you want steampunk with women characters in it, just skip Main Spring. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm sure it's a fine book in other respects. <laughs> <laughs> I really loved Main Spring except the last ten pages. So, but I mean, <laughs> you know. I see that. That's the thing that bothers me is I really want to have, you know, a woman or a young lady who's who even if they start out weak, they grow stronger. But also, you have a male making that same as a counterpoint. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. then they challenge each other to grow and, and whatever, and I think it's more fun. Well, well, starts yeah. as blank as her image on the cover. I mean, that's, that's she's as empty as all that when she starts, and then she's whole by the end. I mean, it's truly a, an epic hero's adventure. Yeah, that's true. Chenda is a, Chenda in the airship Brothman is a great example of a heroine's journey. Absolutely. Highly recommended uh, for that reason and many others. Yeah. Uh, any last questions? Well, you have 30 seconds in the back there. Um, as female writers, mm -hmm. I've been to a lot of writing panels this time at Dragon Con, and I've heard um, that some things about being a female and being a writer have not changed, and I wondered what your experiences as women writing in alternate history or steampunk have been. Um, I have never had a better experience in my life uh, as joining the Women's Science Fiction Writers Association Broad Universe. Um, I have found a wall, no, a mount, no, a universe of support there. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a very broad universe. It is, <laughs> and, yeah. and it is a universe for broads. <laughs> and it, it's a bargain to become a member of Broad Universe. I think it's thirty bucks a year now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and for the that rest of this year, it's fifteen. Fifteen for the rest of for the, the, rest, oh, of the rest of the year. This yeah. year, yeah, they've moved. They've moved the date of. The, do I owe you money? <laughs> am, I, am I current in my membership? Because I'm not letting that fall. The treasurer uh, already left, so I can't ask her. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, I, it, it was everything from the push to put things out. You know, they have this thing called the mailing party where you say, oh, I've sent a short story to this, or I've done this, or, you know, they, they push you to push things out. There's writing help that you can get. That's how I found my editor, Catherine. Um, what do you do at your first book signing? I mean, I threw that up on the message board and got 15 good comments about how to behave or how to do or how to plan and how to do a reading and how to, and they have an incredible support system. So you can find good things. And yeah, you know, some sometimes, People say stupid stuff. Well, you know, I think so. from my experience, because with not in broad universe, I mean, but yeah. to women as writers. But I mean, I don't well, buy to it. Women as I don't anything. Buy it at all. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't actually been dissed, but almost everybody, as was mentioned earlier, almost everybody I work with is female all the way through the whole publishing structure. And I notice that sometimes the biases can be just as strong. I've had discussions with one particular editor about the Demon Trapper series. He saw it solely as only teen girls were going to be reading it. And, and there is a 22-year-old male protagonist in the series who is equally a strong character as Riley, but my editor only saw that, only saw Riley. He's hunky. And he's hunky. And if you get, you ask the, the reader. Think Sawyer and Lost, if you're a Lost fan. He's a nice red, redneck oh, Jedi. Redneck he's Jedi. a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it was funny because she only saw the teen girl aspect of it. And when you're talking to the readers, they're going, yeah, yeah, I really love Riley, but oh my god, Beck. You know, and, and so you, sometimes you even get that kind of bias, and even from other females. And he's got that, that flaw and needs to make that journey, too. Yeah, he, that, has, yeah. he has as, as big well, a journey as Riley. not just that flaw, those flaws. Oh, he has many <laughs> flaws. I love, I love how you set it up that he loves her like nobody's business and can't get over himself to get to that. Yeah, he just can't get there. And so that, even, the, even within the, the, the females, a hierarchy of, of publishing and whatever. Sometimes you bump into biases like that and you have to quietly mm. nudge them. I mean, I I think one one thing I notice, like if you're if you're look, hunting for an agent or something like that, there are times when you know I'll look at an agent's website and see every writer they represent is male. You know, for example, um, or you know, occasionally you know you come across publishers whose lists are very very male heavy. Now that's not to say that, I mean, that I, I, I read books by men, you know, I like books by men as well as books by women. I tend so to prefer books by women. women are written by men. <laughs> my favorite women are all written by men. But, um, uh, so it, it just depends and maybe, maybe it's harder to find a niche. They used to say, and this, this is very recent, you know, you keep reading things that say, oh, men don't like to read about women, 
Uh, women will read about women or men, but men will only read about other men. And it seems like there are there are still people in publishing that believe, believe that. that. Which is wrong. Which is wrong. I mean, in fact, <laughs> we were just talking the last panel as it ended to two young men who were both in the Navy and served aboard uh, submarines and were reading um, it was a bone shaker? Yeah. They, they, yeah. Yeah, and they were, they, and, and yeah. honestly, they have full full punches on their man card. I mean, yeah. they're going right. to be submarine officers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, amply tattooed and, you know, buzz cut and the whole, yeah. and they were going on and on about this, you know, book by a woman author, about, about a woman, woman character, character. and um, so it's just, the things people think they know, they often don't know. They haven't caught up, they're behind the curve. Well, that and the bias is getting grained because they used to say that young adults, teens wouldn't read thick books. They assumed that they could only read books about that thick and then that their attentions would go off and turn to vapor. <laughs> Harry Potter people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So all of a sudden, ah, now the way seven hundred and ninety five Yeah, the only reason New York suddenly wised up is they were looking at the dollar signs and going, oh my God, yeah. kids like read big fat books we should like print some. But, know, but so. notice how, you know, J.K. Rowling published J. as J.K. Because she was writing about a boy, Essie and the, and yeah, and the, but S.E. Hinton is like a generation ago, and even well, still and today, there is someone had asked us not one of the panels, which was how do you write your men, how do you write your women? As a woman, how do I write a man? And I just, you know, people are people. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's a bit to it, but I mean, not only did S.E. Hinton write a collection of classic male characters in The Outsiders, mm -hmm. but she wrote like six of them. And they all have a different personality. I mean, it's very impressive. If you want to look at the, how a woman writes a man, read The Outsiders. So, You know, I kind of wanted to ask you guys a little bit about that, and you touched on it a bit, but when you're writing a character, do you think about, you know, I'm going to write a female character who does X, Y, and Z, or do you think more about, you know, this is the character I want to portray, and they, you know, then become male or female um, down the line? How does that kind of character process evolve? I, I do it because I, all of my characters in my books are my dorky friends. Um, and no, but, but to say, how do I write a man? Oops. I have, I have, um, which one am I? You know, the tall guy walking back here is one of them. You know, he ends up in one of my, he's in one of my books, you know. But it's easy for me to write um, Charlie because, you know, I made, a, he's like a, a, a little, a small character. He's a cook in, in, on the airship. And, and so if I, if I say, okay, how would Charlie behave? <clears throat> I know a man who's like the character that I'm writing and I use when I get, if I get a doubt or I get lost, I go, well, I'm gonna make Charlie do this, so. I, my process is, is different than that. I don't model any of my characters on real people. And for me, I start out, um, <laughs> Which is sad because every friendship now I start, I have to say everything you can say will be used in a novel. Yeah, so. I, I actually I have, a, I have a, a friend who gave me a t-shirt that says, be careful or I'll put you in my novel. But I don't actually do that. I um, do. <laughs> I, so be extra careful around it. Uh, what I do is like, I, um, well, my circuit riding preacher character was inspired by, I was um, copy editing a book and there was the, a picture of um, an African-American preacher visiting uh, members of his congregation. And I loved the picture and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if, you know, I had like a woman who was doing that? You know, I, I'd like to plug women into into everything. <laughs> and and also the other the other genesis of her is I wear glasses and I get so tired of books and movies where the female character gets a makeover and ditches her glasses and it's like I want to read about women who wear glasses. <laughs> um, so you know I thought oh my circuit riding preacher of course she's gonna have little spectacles. Um, so you know that's just an example of like one one way that I, I you get this gentle yeah, I love Candace. Um, and and then when, when I'm writing other characters, for example, in my epic fantasy, I the it's there's a very strong female character and a very strong male protagonist as well. 
And I was worried about, oh, you know, I, I'm so used to writing women, and can I write a man? So what I did was I read the entire Master and Commander series uh -huh. by Patrick O'Brien, which I love. Uh, it's my favorite movie. And I thought, if I can read, like, you know, how, um, how a man writes these male characters in depth, that will help clue me in. And, and that's when I realized, that's, people are people. You know, just keep it, you know, don't worry, is, is this how a man would act? Is this how a woman would act? Worry about, is this how this character would act? And the other thing I do is, while I don't model characters on real people that I know, I do hear, I hear the voices in my head. So, like when I'm writing dialogue to get the speech patterns and the rhythms right, um, like, you know, uh, some of my uh, like in my epic fantasy, the male protagonist happens to sound a lot like Liam Neeson. Um, you know, some of them sound like Russell Crowe. Um, more and more of them are sounding like Hugh Jackman in his various roles. <laughs> but I don't, I don't model their appearance that way, but it helps me to hear how they speak to make that dialogue sound realistic. I know they're male or female, and I just let them go from there. They just start talking to me, and I hear them. And I never would have anticipated that Denver Beck would be a South Georgia boy. But the first line of dialogue started dropping cheese, and there was a drawl, and I went, well, hell, we're, we're going here. <laughs> so uh, this will be fun. Getting, getting the characters to stop talking is, in your head is the trick. <laughs> so, how, how many of us, when we write, it's we write because otherwise we die a horrible death. <laughs> My people. <laughs> I think we're out of time, aren't we? We're past out of time. Thank you, Mom. Uh, I think, Janet, you have books available, yes? I did. Oh, oh get yourself one of these Atlanta Demon, Demon Trappers badges. She's oh, got these. Yeah. Atlanta Demon Trappers Guild. Yes, yeah, she has swag. She has <laughs> swag. <laughs> we have swag. peanuts and candy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, I, I, I'm out of books, but I do have a few CDs left. I'm also a poet and lyricist, and this is my husband's solo CD, and I wrote the lyrics to one of the songs on it. So, so. And, I could take uh, a piece of my home. I have a special deal for you up here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you guys are uh, e-reader users, uh, all the books are a bargain on the e-reader. Um, 